Hello there, and welcome back to the Senate Podcast. We're on episode number nine. I'm your host, Caleb Johnston, and today I'm not joined by anybody. This is going to be the first solo episode. What we got going on today is the first crisis in the history of comic book movies. I actually reached out to a few people that I know who actually make content involving comic books and movies and games. And I haven't got back from them, but I really want their opinions. But before I can make an opinion-based episode, I want to put this episode out there as a comprehensive you know, list of what is actually going on. As we get through the episode, I'm going to be pointing out some things that are actually huge. They're big deals. And I want to have all of it laid out in detail before I give my opinions or I have somebody on to give their opinions because a lot has been going on in the last year or so involving comic book movies. So like I said, the Senate podcast, we're on episode number nine. We're on Apple podcast, Spotify, Google podcast. I'm going to put these up on YouTube. We're going to try to have weekly episodic releases. Really, I'm putting these out whenever I feel like it. I want to put them out when I have something to say. And sometimes I don't feel like talking at the same time every week. There's times like right now where I get on here and I make a Google Doc and I just feel like being a journalist. I, I made a Google Doc of things I want to talk about today. Like I said, solo episode. So you're just going to be hearing me putting out a lot of information. So before I get into all of that information, I just want to talk a little bit about what I've been playing and what I've been watching over the last week or few weeks. So Wakanda Forever just came out on Disney+. Plus. I watched that yesterday. I have a lot of thoughts on Wakanda Forever, but instead of just talking about Wakanda Forever, I kind of want to talk about Avatar Way of Water versus Wakanda Forever. These movies came out around the same time actually very close, probably within a month of each other. They're similar, but not in a way. Reason I want to compare the two are I think, you know, I think the VFX, there's a huge difference in the VFX between these movies. You know, the, the plot and the story and the characters are completely different. If you want to put them side by side in terms of movie making, in terms of direction, artistic design choices, between the storytelling and the VFX. The VFX are absolutely incredible in Avatar, and the VFX are not good in Wakanda Forever. VFX weren't great in the first Black Panther movie, but I noticed specifically in Wakanda Forever, the VFX were absolutely terrible. Look at Iron Man, literally the character of Iron Man from Iron Man 2008, versus Ironheart in 2022's Black Panther Wakanda Forever. That's 14 years. Ironheart looks completely unrealistic. You know, I'm not talking about how they handled the character and the writing, the characterization. I'm talking about just the VFX, the design choices. It looked terrible. Okay, and then you get to Namor's people. Namor's design was amazing. His VFX looked pretty good when he was flying around with his winged feet, the way they had that. That was more of a design choice. The VFX were pretty good for it, but his people, any scene in the water looked almost terrible. It looked almost terrible. I'm not sure exactly how they design the characters in real life with the blue versus the normal skin when they come out of the water. Their blue skin and the underwater scenes looked terrible. And this is a movie that came right before Avatar Way of Water, which Avatar Way of Water looked realistic. It had some of the best VFX I have ever seen in a movie. Wakanda Forever looked like an Unreal Engine 4 cinematic. And that's being generous. Avatar Way of Water looked, you know, Unreal Engine 5 and beyond. It looked like the Decima Engine but way better. So I just want to compare the two. You know, you can argue which one's better or worse. I liked Avatar infinitely more. Avatar Way of Water, I'd say, is a 9 out of 10. Wakanda Forever, at best, is a 7 out of 10. 
that's at best. I just, I'm really caught up on the VFX. Uh, besides that, it was a good movie in terms of story. I really like the characters. I think the actors all did an amazing job, and that's the only thing that saved the movie, in my opinion, were just the actors and how they portrayed their characters, obviously coming off of the craziness that is the MCU. But that being said, put it next to a movie that I think, you know, is fair to compare it to, which is Avatar. Avatar blows it out of the water. That's what I've been watching. So real quick, what I've been playing over the last week or two, I'm still I'm still playing Horizon Forbidden West. I absolutely love this game. I've stopped playing God of War Ragnarok just so I could focus on beating Horizon Forbidden West. I'm 25 hours in the game and I just made it to the actual Forbidden West section. I'm not sure if I'm just going very slow or I'm just enjoying the open world and the side quests and the side missions and the ruins and relics and everything. The hunting grounds. I'm doing everything I can do. Besides that, loving the game. So far, it's a 10 out of 10. Absolutely insane story compared to the first one, where they're going with it. I love the sci-fi in it. Game is amazing. All right. And the last thing I'll say for this is about Forspoken. I just downloaded the Forspoken demo because I was thinking about getting the game. Now, this game recently came out and there's a lot of drama around the game, specifically because a lot of people think it's trash. A lot of people are saying this game is terrible. And while I'm on here, let me look up the Metacritic. All right. Forspoken Metacritic has a 66 on Metacritic. That's the meta score. That's terrible. That is absolutely terrible. I hear it is like a 2 out of 10 when it comes to the story and the dialogue and the characterization. But I hear it's a 9 or even I've seen people giving it a 10 out of 10. There are people on here giving it 10s out of 10s on Metacritic. You can go on here and look. There are people giving it zeros and people giving it 10. But anyways, I hear that the combat, especially the traversal mechanics, I guess the magic that you use in the combat is done very well. Looks fluid. Looks like a lot of fun. I remember last year or when this was announced in 2021, I was really looking forward to it. It was probably in my top five most anticipated games of the year. And that slowly went down. The user score on here is a 3.5. So I'm hoping to get into the demo and just ignore the graphics which actually aren't that impressive and just ignore the dialogue and just have fun traversing through the world and fun with the combat. This game is very interesting to me still because I was really looking forward to this game. And then it kind of went from being, oh, this game looks like an eight out of 10 to, oh, this is actually a three out of 10. This is actually a two out of 10. So I kind of want to just go in uh, firsthand and judge it for myself. All right. So last episode we did our 2023 metacritic draft that was me and andrew tate smith so what i want to do is just real quick run through our list give you the finalized list right now because these games are coming out soon some of them all right let's go with andrew's list first i'm going from 1 to 12 right now and he has the legend of zelda tears of the kingdom hollow knight silk song atomic heart horizon call of the mountain the wolf among us 2 alan wake 2 Street Fighter 6, Hogwarts Legacy, Dead Island 2, Assassin's Creed Mirage, Skull and Bones, and Crash Team Rumble. Now the last two I picked for him, hopefully to get him uh, lower scores to bring his average down. And then I'll go through my list right now, 1 through 12. Spider-Man 2, Resident Evil 4 Remake, Forza Motorsport, Sea of Stars, Jedi Survivor, Final Fantasy 16, Wild Hearts, Lies of P, Octopath Traveler 2, Armored Core 6, Starfield, and Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. And like I said, last two Andy picked for me to bring down my score, but Starfield and Avatar probably going to score in the high 70s, low 80s. So that's our fantasy draft, our Metacritic draft for 2023. That's the finalized list right there. Some of these games are coming out soon. Uh, Atomic Hearts coming out this month. Super excited for that. At the end of the month, Horizon Call of the Mountain. Uh, what's the next one? Oh yeah, Hogwarts Legacy. Those reviews actually drop in a few days, I believe. So we'll probably have an update on that next episode. Well, that's it for the games. 
most of our episodes have been solely games. We've had some more, you know, general pop culture related episodes, but most of them have been video game focused. This one I want to keep movie focused. So first thing we're going to get into, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I have here Black Adam vs. Superman, The Dawn of James Gunn. So I'm going to The Rock's Twitter right now. December 20th at 4.59 p.m. He posted on here Black Adam with a lightning bolt. And there's a picture where he writes to, he says, my passionate friends. Quote, I wanted to give you a long awaited Black Adam update regarding the character's future in the new DC universe. James Gunn and I connected and Black Adam will not be in their first chapter of storytelling. However, DC and Bucks have agreed to continue exploring the most valuable ways Black Adam can be utilized in the future DC multiverse chapters. James and I have known each other for years and have always rooted for each other to succeed. It's no different now, and I will always root for DC and Marvel to win and win big. You guys know me, and I have very thick skin, and you can always count on me to be direct with my words. These decisions made by James and DC leadership represent their vision of DCU through their creative lens. After 15 years of relentless hard work to finally make Black Adam, I'm very proud of the film we deliver for fans worldwide. I will always look back on the fan reaction to Black Adam with tremendous gratitude, humility, and love. We did great. To my very passionate and vocal Black Adam superhero genre fans, I love you, thank you, and I will always listen to you and do my best to deliver and entertain you. End quote. That was The Rock on Twitter regarding this huge shakeup that's just happened over at DC Studios. I call it the first crisis in the history of comic book movies. History is being made because there's a huge thing that happens every few years in comic books, really every decade or two in comic books, where they they do a hard reset or a soft reboot of the entire universe. That has never happened before in comic book cinematic universes. But what's happening right now at DC is actually a crisis of sorts where the universe is being reset. So the Snyderverse and now the DJEU, the Dwayne Johnson Extended Universe, have been scrapped. But part-time superhero, part-time felon, Ezra Miller may be DC's only hope. And that leads us right into the main topic of the show. The official DC movie slate under James Gunn. 20 projects have just been announced, and it looks like the crisis that is the Flash film will be the universe reset, soft reboot of sorts, that James Gunn will use to finally turn DC into the MCU. James Gunn, on his DC Universe, quote, The Flash will reset the entire DC Universe. Blue Beetle and the Aquaman sequel will then lead into the new slate projects. The actors within those projects could return in future projects, end quote. Along with Dwayne Johnson's Black Adam being featured in later chapters or phases. <laughs> However, not alongside the likes of Henry Cavill's Superman or Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman. But one part of the DC Trinity may remain. That's Ben Affleck's Batman. As Batman is set to make an appearance in both the Flash movie or the next Aquaman movie. Now that there is a plan going forward, thanks to Kevin Feige, I mean James Gunn, we can write this moment in the history books as the first crisis in a comic book cinematic universe. All right, let me explain this a little more. I'm going to Axios.com. James Gunn unveils new DC reboot slate. Here's what to expect. Quote, DC Studios co-CEO James Gunn unveiled his plan for a reboot of the DC cinematic universe, announcing a slew of new movies and television shows set to drop in the near future. Here's why it matters. The DC Studios is a branch of Warner Brothers dedicated to superhero content. It's rebooting DC's comics IP after fans endured years of disconnected, confusing, and polarizing projects going back to the Snyderverse and up to this Black Adam versus Superman, Dwayne Johnson, you know, stuff that really wasn't a thing but was a thing for a few months when nobody was head of DC. So they brought in James Gunn going on here. Gunn's rebooted DC Slate will directly compete again with the MCU with an interconnected story told through live action and animated projects. The new direction represents a major turning point in the superhero movie genre too, as it marks the first reboot of a modern comic book cinematic universe. 
So the new DC slate, we're actually going to dive into that in detail here in a minute. Gunn said that The Flash will reset the entire DC universe, but there are certain projects like Blue Beetle and the Aquaman sequel that will lead into the new slate of projects, Elseworld content that we will get into towards the end. And there's really no telling what actors are going to be cut. So the current projects being kept, Shazam, Fury of the Gods, The Flash, and The Flash will create a universe reset. This will be the first crisis in the DCEU, which will lead into Blue Beetle and the Aquaman sequel, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Enter James Gunn and his slate, which will be called Chapter One, Gods and Monsters. So I'll get into the DCU movies announced on his Twitter video. Superman Legacy. This is the only project with a release date, July 11th, 2025, written by Gunn. Superman Legacy will follow Kal-El as he reconciles his extraterrestrial origins with his human family and upbringing. Sounds like a reboot of 2013's Man of Steel, directed by Zack Snyder, with one important key element missing. Henry Cavill is not coming back as Superman. So expect a lot of anticipation and hype as we get closer to this because the next step is James Gunn finding his lead role as Superman. All right, moving on. The Authority. This superhero ensemble dates to a 1999 comic book series published under DC's Wildstorm imprint. The Authority is a group of seven heroes with very high concept superpowers. One, Jack Hawksmore It will be the first appearance of Wildstorm canon in the DC universe. I have no idea what any of that means. Listen, I know DC. I love DC. I have no idea what that is. The Brave and the Bold. The Brave and the Bold is a Silver Age DC comics title that for about 15 years starred Batman and Robin in crossover stories with other DC characters. It was also the title of a three-season Batman animated series airing on Cartoon Network from 2008 to 2011. DC Studios' new releases say that DCU will introduce its Batman and Robin in this unusual father-son story inspired by Grant Morrison's comic series. That series was inspired by the animated show. Next movie, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. DC Studios says this picture, based on Tom King's award-winning comic stories, presents a Supergirl viewers are not used to seeing. Truthfully, they're not used to seeing Supergirl on a big screen at all. Her only theatrical appearance so far is 1984's Supergirl, starring Helen Slater as Kara Zor-El. So, Supergirl movie, Batman movie, uh, weird superhero ensemble movie, and of course Superman. The last DCU movie will be Swamp Thing. Believe it or not, Swamp Thing, whose first appearance was in 1971's House of Secrets, Number 92 appeared in two movies back in the 1980s. The first one, 1982 Swamp Swamp Thing, directed by horror master Wes Craven. DC Studios' lineup announcement says only that this movie will investigate the dark origins of Swamp Thing. All right, so before I go on to TV shows, I'll just give my opinions on uh, five movies that are being announced. You know, I think it's smart to start with Superman and hopefully within a year, year and a half after the Superman movie comes Batman, the brave and the bold. Hopefully we don't wait too long. So essentially we're starting out chapter one, gods and monsters with Superman and Batman. You know, if you're doing a soft reboot or a crisis, usually, you know, usually you don't have the same iterations of the characters when you reboot a a universe. This Superman is obviously not going to be Henry Cavill. He's not coming back. He came back for his cameo in black Adam, spoiler alert. That's it. He's not coming back. James Gunn's going to be directing this instead of Zack Snyder. So the movie is going to have a completely different feel to it. It's called Legacy. You know, you can expect the Guardians of the Galaxy family friendly humor, I guess. Atmosphere for this movie. I think it's smart starting with Superman. All right. And then you go. Then we got the Brave and the Bold. That is, you know, that's a great series. It's a great comic series. It's uh, with Batman and Robin. So. The reason this is exciting is, you know, we finally get to see the dynamic duo. We get to see Batman and Robin. Uh, It says this unusual father-son story inspired by the comic series. So that's probably the most anticipated movie out of all of these. You know, how could you not be excited for finally seeing 
Batman and Robin on here that isn't George Clooney or Val Kilmer. Pretty exciting stuff. You know, Supergirl, that's exciting. I wonder if they're going to keep the girl they just cast as Supergirl for The Flash. Hmm. You know, it's there's obviously a lot of better options out there, like a Green Lantern movie or a Justice League movie. They'll probably wait for other chapters to do that. Or you could even have a Black Adam Part 2 in here. You know, you're starting with Superman and Batman. It just seems weird to kind of go to Supergirl, but it is what it is. The Authority, you know, I hope these movies work out, but this is just a waste of resources. You're wasting a lot of time and money for these things. The Authority is probably going to be a $250 to $400 million movie, and it's probably only going to make six to $700 million. It's not going to be worth it. That's And that's me being generous. That's, that's highballing this thing. All right, last movie, Swamp Thing. We just had a Swamp Thing show that was pretty good. Uh, let me look up Swamp Thing. Okay, here we go. Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, 74% audience score. If you have a, a high, <laughs> a highly reviewed Swamp Thing show that I'm not sure how many seasons it had, but it started in 2019, why would you jump to a movie? Swamp Thing is not is not an iconic DC character. This movie is going to be anywhere from probably, you know, 200, 300 or 350 million dollars and it's only going to make guarantee you at the most 500 million. Not going to be worth it at all. So you got two of these five where, you know, I give I give them an A. Give them an A plus for that. You should start out your chapter 1 with Superman and Batman, specifically Batman and Robin. I I like this a lot. You're going to be wasting three to five, hopefully no more than five years with the authority, Supergirl and Swamp Thing. And you're wasting, you're going to waste $1.5 million on all these with maybe you might, might make back 2 million or 2 billion, sorry, 1.5 billion. You might make back two to 2.5 billion on these. It's a waste. Okay. Getting into the DCU TV shows. Creature Commandos. Gunn is the writer for this series, already pegged at seven episodes. In it, Amanda Waller, the director of the Suicide Squad, forms another super team out of monstrous prisoners. This could be a lot worse. And I'll explain why with the very next one. But Creature Commandos, it could be a lot worse. It's essentially what he did with the Suicide Squad movie, except in a TV you know, series, I don't know what it's going to be on. Probably HBO. Suicide Squad movie did great. This, I think, you know, with chapter one being gods and monsters, this is where the monsters aspect comes in. And, you know, there are iconic monsters within DC. So as long as this show carries that same energy that Suicide Squad had with King Shark and Starro and whatnot, this is a good TV show. I mean, it's it's at seven episodes. Not a big deal. All right. <laughs> Next is Waller. As in Amanda Waller. If Creature Commandos wasn't enough, this series dedicated to Amanda Waller stars Viola Davis in the lead role. DC Studios says the show will feature Team Peacemaker and is written by Watchmen's uh Crystal Henry and Supernatural's Jeremy Carver. Okay. The only reason they're making this series is to just keep the talent around. That's it. This is essentially the spiritual successor to Peacemaker, which is keeping James Gunn's wife involved in the universe. It's keeping Viola Davis involved in the universe. And it's keeping John Cena involved in the universe. That's the only reason they're making this series is to keep this talent around and just keep a semi good thing going. Peacemaker got decent viewership. So that's the only reason they're carrying it over into Waller. In reality, a lot of DC fans don't want this. If anything, they should just continue Peacemaker as it is. So, all right, the next TV series or show, Booster Gold. Finally, DC Comics' longtime comic relief character is a time traveler who uses basic technology 
and consumer appliances from the future to make himself a superhero in the present day. All right, so there's a lot of MCU and DC crossover with certain characters, you know, or actors, I should say, or um, inspired characters. Booster Gold, if there was ever a time to bring Chris Pratt over, <laughs> which obviously has a he has a close relationship with James Gunn, it's for Booster Gold. Booster Gold is, you know, is an iconic character who deserves a TV series. You know, scrap creature commandos and Waller. Give us Booster Gold. This is going to be a hit because this is, you know, a long time requested character to be on the big screen. You know, Booster Gold teams up with Blue Beetle in the comics. And there's a Blue Beetle movie coming out. So maybe we'll see Booster Gold in it and that will spin off into the TV show. Maybe that's why they put this on the slate is to keep that talent around in a Booster Gold series. That seems logical. So I would assume there is some connection there with the Blue Beetle sh- uh, movie and the Booster Gold show. Who knows? Overall, that's the best one so far. Until we get to the next one that James Gunn mentions, which I guess is just titled Lanterns. The Green Lantern Corps have been the galaxy's foremost law enforcement agency since 1959, making Hal Jordan, the Silver Age Green Lantern, and Jon Stewart, uh, first appearance in 1971, perfect for a buddy cop team-up. DC Studios said it will be an enormous TV event series focused on the two unraveling a dark mystery. So this is going to be a huge hit. They, They should somehow tie this into a movie or... Or something. I know originally, way back when the Snyderverse first revealed uh, the phases and its slates, I believe Phase 4 had lanterns in it as a movie. So this could be those actors or talent or resources dedicated to that carrying over into a TV show. I kind of like lanterns as a TV series, a high, you know, it says an enormous TV event series, a high budget TV series. Hopefully if it, it's, it's on HBO and we can find out who the producers are and the showrunners are for this because Booster Gold mixed with Lanterns, that's going to be a good year for DC. Get Booster Gold and Lanterns out together. You got Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart, you know, buddy cop. Probably going to go. It says a dark mystery. So... I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how they handle a Lanterns TV series. That's exciting. All right. Last TV show. Paradise Lost. It's set in Themyscira, so you know this show will touch Wonder Woman's history and character arc. It's not clear if she will star in it, though. This drama focuses on the genius and political intrigue of an island of all women, DC Studios said, which sounds very Game of Thrones-y. This is going to be a flop. It's going to be a complete flop. You can't have Themyscira or the Amazonians without Wonder Woman. I could see them maybe tying Donna Troy or one of them into this to be the main character, but you can't have a show based off of Themyscira, uh, an island of all women without having a central character somebody knows. It's almost like I see them doing something like they did with uh, Pennyworth, except even less successful as Pennyworth. Which Pennyworth was good. They should they should do more like that. It was actually a good series. Paradise Lost sounds like a a throwaway series. So all in all with the shows and series, um, oh, the movies and the shows or series, whatever you want to call it, you got Batman and Superman, so two out of five, and you got Booster Gold and Lanterns, two out of five. All right, so far I would rate James Gunn's slate kind of somewhere in the middle. I give it like a C plus. That's be being generous. I give it a C plus. I give it a six out of ten slightly above you know middle I don't know if James Gunn has a say in the Elseworlds 
w- what he describes as the Elseworlds content. I don't think he does, which is why DC Elseworlds is actually going to be my favorite. I love Elseworlds stories in general in comics. They're just good stories that don't necessarily have to tie in with anything. They could do whatever they want. DC Elseworlds is where Joker and the Batman live. He also announced that the Joker sequel, Fully Ado, Joker, it's French, I believe, Fully Ado, um, is going to be a DC Elseworlds story. And I'm excited for that. And I looked up what that meant because I was like, oh, that has to mean something. It means delusion or mental illness shared by two people in close association. This is going to be a good movie. The first Joker movie was a 10 out of 10. The sequel is going to be great. Same with the Batman. The Batman sequel is going to be a DC Elseworlds story. You already know Matt Reeves is going to knock it out of the park again with that. So DC Elseworlds got the Joker and the Batman. That's going to be the best vertical of this new slate is going to be the Elseworlds. You also got... I guess Teen Titans Go is going to live on and Superman and Lois as well. So you got those shows in there and movies in the Elseworlds. The Flash on the CW is ending. Uh, I'm not sure what else is going to live on in Elseworlds. So far, those are the only things right there. And I'm assuming all of the DC animated universe movies and shows are going to be like um, obviously the animated movies, but the shows as in... Um, Young Justice and why am I blanking? Those shows are going to be in the Elseworlds. All right. All in all, James Gunn, just because (laughs) you had some successful movies in the MCU and Suicide Squad, well, sorry, not David Ayer's Suicide Squad. James Gunn's The Suicide Squad was successful doesn't mean he should be the next Kevin Feige. Honestly, I would have rather The Rock just been the Kevin Feige of the DC Universe. Which apparently he was really pitching to the execs at Discovery after they bought out WB. Apparently he pitched a multi-year movie plan with, you know, interconnecting movies like this involving Henry Cavill's Superman coming back for a sequel, uh, the Black Adam sequel, and other movies all interconnecting leading up to another Justice League or a Superman versus Black Adam movie, still involving the same actors that were brought in in the Snyderverse. I would have preferred that. You know, that's what I was going to get to earlier during the Black Adam versus Superman, Dawn of the James Gunn, or, you know, Twitter status I read, an article and whatnot. You know, it went from Snyderverse to soft reboot with, you know, a few months of the Dwayne Johnson extended universe. But now James Gunn came in and he's using part-time hero, part-time felon Ezra Miller to just simultaneously destroy and save the DC Universe. So we'll see where it goes from here. Either way, the MCU is still going strong with its phases, whatever phase it's on, phase 10 probably. It hasn't had a reboot. They are somewhat soft rebooting with uh, Spider-Man, if you want to even call it a soft reboot. But it wasn't an actual crisis reboot like you would see in the comics. What's happening at DC right now is something you would actually see in the comics where it would reset the entire universe and the whole landscape would look different. Where a few things were kept from New 52, a few things were brought back from uh, pre-New 52, and it was all kind of mixed together because of this big crisis. And the crisis was actually Flashpoint. Kind of makes sense that The Flash movie would be a Flashpoint story that would reset the universe. I think that's smart. I just don't think that movies like The Authority or Swamp Thing are needed. Or series like Waller or Paradise Lost are needed. Supergirl. Okay. Or Creature Commandos. That's up James Gunn's alley. And he's the writer for that series. I get it. But so far, the slate's not looking good. It's very similar to the first phase of the MCU. But it ended with Avengers. If they could wrap chapter one, Gods and Monsters, to end with, you know, a banger of a movie like Avengers, I think a lot of this can be overlooked. Problem is, it's just going to take years to get to that point. And right now, we just want some good movies. We just got off of Black Adam, which Black Adam was great. Movie was fantastic. They're potentially scrapping the sequel to that and only bringing 
the rock back for ensemble appearances. We still have Shazam Fury of the Gods. I'm sure that'll be the last Shazam movie. For some reason, The Flash is remaining untouched, essentially. Blue Beetle is going to be amazing. This will probably be the last Aquaman movie. They're probably going to throw Jason Momoa and Ben Affleck out in that movie somehow, especially with all the drama surrounding <laughs> um, some of the people in that movie. That's really my analysis of it, though. I don't really have much else to say. It's just sad to see actors like Henry Cavill, Ben Affleck, and Dwayne Johnson go and they fit the roles so perfectly. Imagine a Superman versus Black Adam, you know, crossover movie where or, or you could literally have the Superman and Shazam versus Black Adam, just like the animated movie. That would that would have been my dream DC EU. This is just me explaining and detailing the James Gunn slate. You know, soon I might have an episode where we theorize what our DC universe would look like because it would not be like this. And this is getting very mixed reception online. Not great reception at all, actually. Top three, taking away the top three, and then we're out of here. Brave and the Bold, that's up there. That's going to be cool to see, Batman and Robin. Uh, Booster Gold, it's going to be great to see Booster Gold finally on the big screen in the TV series. And then, of course, Lanterns. That's going to be amazing. Seeing how Jordan, one of my favorite DC characters ever. Those are probably top three. And then, obviously, anything else world any of the Batman movies or Joker movies. Those are just a few of my thoughts on <laughs> phase one gods and monsters of the DC EU or whatever they're calling it. It's going to be interesting going from here, seeing how much further they screw this up. Anyways, thanks for listening. This is the first solo episode, so hopefully it was, it was bearable, listenable. I don't know. I really don't know what I'm doing just on here. Felt like being a, a journalist for a little bit and thank you for listening. Social medias, they'll be in the link tree at General J 501st or the Senate podcast. We have a discord that'll be in the link tree. Of course, of course, listen on the streaming services like Apple podcast, Google podcast, Spotify. So let me know what you think about the DC universe and thank you for listening. So until next time.